So Chef Melissa King is one of the most exciting talents in America's culinary scene, winning Top Chef All-Stars after placing as a finalist on Bravo's Top Chef season 12 in Boston. As a proud Asian American queer woman, King has a passion for supporting the community, working with nonprofits such as the Human Rights Campaign, Tegan and Sarah Foundation, and more. She was honored as a celebrity grand marshal for San Francisco Pride and has modeled for Levi's in a global campaign supporting the LGBTQ community. Chef King has over 15 years of experience in the culinary industry and has helmed several Michelin starred restaurants and kitchens in San Francisco under acclaimed names such as Dominique Crun and Ron Siegel. After completing her BA in Cognitive Science at the UC Irvine, King attended the Culinary Institute of America, graduating at the top of her class. She's a certified level one SOM and has been recognized as one of the best female chefs in San Francisco and 40 under 40 rising star by Threatless. So we'd love to welcome Melissa. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, first off, congratulations <laughs> on the win. How are you feeling? Thank you. Um, it's been it's been crazy. Like my phone has been nonstop since Thursday. Um, I just kind of want to step on it or throw it on the floor. It's driving me nuts, but it's been really good. You know, it's so it's so hard to hold a secret like this. You know, it's like seven months, I think, was when they told us about it. So amazing. It's crazy. Yeah, I think we're we're all wondering now what's what's next for you? Are you planning on taking some time to figure mm -hmm. out next steps or or what can we we look forward to? Yeah, you know, um, I've uh, through quarantine, quarantine's kind of like it's inspired me a lot. It's really changed the direction of some of the ideas that I was originally planning on doing with the with the money and the win. Um, but I started a small batch sauce line. I think some of you may some of you may even have that sauce right now. But um, it's it's been so well received that I kind of want to just start um, investing in that opportunity and really try to get it uh, all to you guys and get it on retail shelves. Um, so just continue to focus on um, these really amazing projects so that I can continue to, to cook and inspire you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, I was not one of the lucky ones who got the sauce. I was not the last <laughs> I'll make sure you get some. One or two minutes. So. <laughs> like literally hundreds of units, like within a minute and a half, we're just gone off the website. So I'm just so grateful that there's people out there that are excited to try my food. And so, yeah, we're going to ramp that up a little more. Awesome. Can you tell us the story behind the sauce? Like why the chili oils? What what got that started for you? Yeah, you know, I think just sitting around in quarantine, you, you start to think like how, you know, for, for me, I was like, how can I bring my food to you? Um, because I can't see you and I, and, and I don't have, you know, this connection with you. So I um, really created these four skews of sauces. Uh, I have a Szechuan chili sauce, a fish sauce, caramel, mm. an EXO, and a mala chili oil, all which I had created on the show. And they were all sauces that I felt really define um, my style of cooking and also mm -hmm. just flavors that I grew up on. So I, I just created it one day and, and launched it and it's been it's been going since. Yeah, we're super thrilled to support you in it. So the last Thank time you were with Google at with talks at Google was in 2017, and a lot has changed since then. It's been super inspiring watching you achieve success at the highest levels. Um, but how has your perspective on success changed as your platform and career grew? Um, let's see. Since since the first top, I guess since the first, I can't remember exactly when I came back for this talk, mm -hmm. but since my first Top Chef. Um, I've certainly grown a lot in my confidence as a chef and even just in my personal life. Um, so I really tried to funnel that energy into just saying yes to a lot of opportunities and kind of leaning into, uh, you know, that fear of, I know a lot of the times I used to kind of just scare myself and, and doubt myself about whether or not I should uh, take on certain opportunities. But mm -hmm. since then, you know, I've consulted internationally around the world. I've um, you know created sauces. I've done a lot of events. Most of my work is very event facing, but now that we're kind of in this scenario with quarantine and everything, um, I've really evolved that model into virtual experiences, like virtual mm -hmm. cooking classes, um, merch lines, products. So just continuing to just like um, be creative and create things that are important to me. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And you've mentioned how you're proud to represent a lot of different communities, right? Both as a queer and Asian American woman working in a male dominated space as a chef. Can you share your identity and like your, your journey in bringing all your parts of your identity to work with you? Yeah, you know, I, I think it wasn't even until my first Top Chef experience where I really recognized how important um, how important that all means to me. Um, I think I came off the show and I started getting a flood of messages from Asian Americans, um, queer, you know, people from the queer community mm -hmm. saying that they're just so inspired from my story. And so that really resonated with me and made me feel, you know, I should continue to use this. I'm, I'm grateful and lucky to be, to have this platform and I should continue to use it and, and use that voice. Um, so yeah, I think beyond just being a chef, I'm like, I happen to be all these other things. I happen to be sort of this triple minority, uh, Asian queer, uh, woman. And so I, I really try to incorporate, um, those, you know, I really try to support the community as much as I can through all the projects that I've, I'm working on. So even from donating the fan favorite money, uh, from Top Chef to organizations like Black Visions Collective, the, Tre the Trevor Project, um, Asian Americans for Equality, all just sort of things that touch upon me and that I feel very strongly about. Absolutely, yeah. So last week we know the Supreme Court ruled that employment discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation is illegal. So it's a landmark win for the gay community and in non-pandemic times, we'd all be celebrating together during Pride, right? So how are yeah. you celebrating Pride this year? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I know Pride is so different this year. And I mean, I that it's my favorite month of the year. I look forward to Pride so much because we get to go and be outside and be ourselves and celebrate, um, but I'm continuing to do that virtually. Um, I know that I think I have a few friends in San Francisco that are coordinating like three day virtual prides. And nice. so just trying to participate in some of those activities. Um, yeah, just doing what I can right now to just continue to celebrate me and who we are, you know, all of us for who, for who we are. Absolutely. We should be proud of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Shifting gears a little bit, as um, talking about kind of what's shaped your career, and as an Asian American woman, what was your family's thoughts on you pursuing a more creative route to success? And has that changed over time, especially with your win as Top Chef? Um, let's see here. I mean, they were certainly not excited when I decided I wanted, or when I had voiced wanting to be a chef um, and wanting to pursue a culinary uh, creative industry. Um, but, you know, I think coming from, you know, my parents are, my parents immigrated here and their first jobs, which I didn't know about, uh, their first jobs were working in restaurants. Mm -hmm. And my mom used to wrap dumplings in Hollywood at like 17 at a Chinese restaurant. And my father was a bus boy. And so they didn't know English coming here. And I think for them, they felt you know, why do you want to go backwards? Like, why, why are you doing this to us? <laughs> you know, we, we, we came to America to give you opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't really understand it. And there was resistance uh, in my younger years, um, especially like high school and college years. But, you know, I, I did the whole traditional route of going to college, sort of trying to please my, my family and, and their dreams. And so I was kind of like living for them. And then after that, I was like, okay, can I live for me now? Like, I just like really want to go to culinary school. And I, I know and feel that this is the right decision. And so from that point on there, there was a lot of support um, and encouragement, especially from, from my mother and my stepfather. Yeah. Um, my dad took a little bit of time, but as you guys <laughs> kind of saw on the show, but he warmed up to it all. <laughs> Has everyone come around? They come around, you know, it's it's just like coming out. They come around at some point <laughs> and they just want you to be happy. And that's, you know, I'm very grateful to have such a supportive family. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like you've really built a successful career outside of the restaurant as well as in the restaurant, like you mentioned. Um, and I'm curious if you have advice for other queer women of color who face external pressures when they're making these difficult decisions about their career. Yeah, I think um, for me, I know with my own experience, I tried to find people that were similar and, and work, I worked under them. Uh, you know, Dominique Crenn was certainly a mentor being a, uh, you know, 
queer woman in a kitchen and you know her Michelin star status. And so I really tried to um, yeah, follow people that I felt were doing the doing the thing and doing it right and uh, and look up to them and ask them questions on on how they could help me. Um, but it was so inspiring just in that environment to to have somebody to look up to. Um, but also just, I think just, yeah, yeah, again, surrounding yourself with the right community, um, helping each other, you know, help like connect with other women, connect with other queer women um, or people of color, you know, just mm -hmm. finding that community and, and using each other and using each other's strengths to, to excel. That's what I would say. Awesome. Um, what was it like working with Dominique Crenn? Like, do you have any fun memories to share? Like, what did you learn in your time working for her? You mentioned that she, her, her restaurant, Atelier Crenn, has, you know, three stars. She's one of the first queer chefs um, to attain three years. Yeah. You know, she, she was the first chef that gave me an opportunity to work um, the hotline. And like at the time I was a much younger chef, I was making like salads and, you know, I was kind of on the cold line, there's sort of this divide. And I, she hired me initially as a cold line chef. And I had just asked her, you know, hey, like, can I just try Can I just try to be on the hotline? I really feel I can do it. And after kind of convincing her, she, she gave me that opportunity. And so I'm forever grateful um, for her just sort of, yeah, giving me that opportunity. Yeah, taking a chance on you. Like taking a chance, exactly. Yeah. And I think maybe she saw a part of of herself and me, I don't, I don't know, you know, but I, I think I was the only woman in the kitchen with her. And so I kind of became her right hand at that time and worked my way up. Amazing. Yeah. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in, so I am going to go through. <laughs> um, it's hard. I know I kind of see them here too. Know, there's like, so there's still many. I, I'll let you handle that. <laughs> questions. Um, just have a few more and um, please be sure to uh, and put any other questions you may have. Um, but I, I want to acknowledge kind of the current environment that we're in and kind of the elevated conversation on racism that we're having nationally and globally. And I know that when you all were filming Top Chef, this was was kind of in the works, right? It was coming coming up. Um, so I'm curious, what's your perspective on everything um, in, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and how you hope it might shape your industry? Sure. Um, you know, I think it's it's a wake up call for everyone for the whole world right now. And it's something that, you know, it's not it's not new to uh, the black community. It's been there for a very, very long time. And they are the ones that really pioneered, um, you know, the the freedom and, and respect that we get as queer people, as Asian Americans. They started that and that movement. And so um, I feel very excited for this time right now, and that that our gener that we we happen to be in this moment uh, where we can make a difference. And so I hope moving forward, um, you know, I actually was just talking to a restaurateur today, and he said he had hired his first diversity and inclusion, um, you know, member of their team for their restaurant group. And so that's so new to my industry that just mm -hmm. there's usually not a person that has that role within a restaurant group. So um, I hope to see more of that. And even with Top Chef, I, I've i always been, at least from my own experience from the Boston season, I've always been such a fan of their ability to cast a very diverse group of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Pat Padma's mentioned recently that she hopes to just continue to ramp up that diversity and, and I would love to see like a trans person on the show or someone from, you know, in that, yeah. in, someone representing that because the, you just don't see it on television. And so I know that um, Top Chef's trying really hard to um, move forward uh, with, a, you know, with more diversity. Absolutely, yeah. And I think what's mm -hmm. been so hopeful is that there's just greater appetite, it seems for that, right? Mm -hmm. Not support black owned businesses to really make sure that this moment becomes a movement and helps us be really thoughtful about the way that we change the industries that we work in. So. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. All right. I, I have a few more fun questions and then I'll get to all the live questions from the audience. <laughs> the juicy so, gossip. I know. <laughs> you want to know. Um, but questions are, how are you staying creative in quarantine? It's a it's a new time. And also, how are you staying fit? And how, who's cutting your hair? <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, well, a lot in one. Um, <laughs> I'm staying inspired by, I just, I can't stop cooking. I literally, um, I can't stop thinking about, you know, how can I continue to bring food to the world? And that's just something that's always in me, even outside of the quarantine world, because I don't have a restaurant. And, um, and I feel, you know, I happen to have created this amazing uh, sort of niche where I can continue to cook without that you know, without having to rely on that. So, um, you know, I'm trying to think of cookbook ideas, um, you know, continuing with the sauce projects, uh, even doing like the virtual cooking classes have been really inspiring for me because I get to interact with you guys and hear exactly what you want to learn and, cr and then develop a class around that. So all of this is like, you know, you can go on my website and kind of look up some of my, my classes um, that are all available. And then the other question you was wonton, how you did a wonton making class, right? To, to support. Yeah, right, exactly. Know? Yeah. And I just been tying them to like chair, you know, charities. Cause I also feel that's just so important to continue to, to, I mean, to give back in the way that I can, um, knowing that I'm just kind of at home and, and doing these things with the virtual experiences. Um, and then you said, who, who's cutting my hair? I'm cutting my own hair. <laughs> like you honestly, like, I've just been like trying to figure it out, but the backside's like it's like a mullet right here. I just I'm embarrassed to show you guys the backside, but the front's like I got it down, you know. I know I normally trim my own my own sides. It, it grows out like a porcupine. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you had one more you had one more question in there that I was gonna answer. How are you staying fit? Oh. Um, I'm jumping on that Peloton with Robin. <laughs> I, mean, I Okay, so I have a Peloton. I also, in my normal life, do uh, Muay Thai kickboxing. Uh, Sometimes, yeah, I like to hike around the city. So yeah, just trying to stay active where I can. I, I even just like walk up and down the street to keep, just keep moving. I think it's so important to take care of your body. And then that kind of like inspires your mind and everything else. It all, it all, it's all connected. It is. It's all, it's all connected. Okay. So we're going to exactly. jump into audience questions now. Um, all right. So we have one from Hebal Kamal Grayson. And it's, the question is, you mentioned that your confidence has grown over the years. Mm -hmm. which is amazing. Are there specific experiences or strategies that contributed to that? The biggest experience for me um, was was the Top Chef experience for Boston. So like five years ago, I felt I felt like a different person. And I think even when you watch it, it's, it feels a, a little bit different. But um, I remember being completely terrified to even try out for the show, but I had like friends and family kind of pushing me and encouraging me to do it. Um, but I just embraced that. I like leaned into it and was like, you know what, this scares the crap out of me, but like, let's do it and see what happens. And so I went for it. And, you know, of course, went through the battles and the challenges, which were also terrifying. I had I had anxiety the entire season, um, but I came out such a stronger person. Um, and again, I think I mentioned, you know, it was the confidence that I found in myself through my food, but also just through the experience of doing something that just scared me. Um, so I kind of took that on over the next five or six years and just went with it, went, went with that energy. And even when they approached me this time around to do um, the all-star season, I remember kind of like, I don't know if I want to do this. Like <laughs> it was so stressful the first time. I'm kind of scared to go up against Brian Voltaggio and all these other amazing names and, and this talented group of chefs. Um, but I I just started thinking, you know what? It's, it's, it's again, it's, if it scares you, like, go and do it, like give it a chance and see what happens and see the person that you become on the other side of that journey. So I guarantee you, you will survive it. It may not be comfortable. It'll be extremely uncomfortable, but that's how it all starts. And that's how you grow and Absolutely. become stronger. Yeah, feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Feeling the fear, yeah. <laughs> So we have a question from Laura Devine. She says, many people in quarantine are using their time to try new dishes. Have you been stepping out of your culinary comfort zone while shel sheltering in place <laughs> and sharing fun creations with the audience? Yeah, you know, I, I got uh, completely obsessed with baking bread the first like 
couple months or a couple weeks of, of quarantine. And like, I know how to bake bread, but I was really trying to perfect that craft mm -hmm. of the sourdough wild yeast thing, like everybody else in the world. Um, but I got really also into the Instapot, which <laughs> I do not own one. And then I had dro drove, I drove down here to LA and my sister's obsessed with the Instapot. And I was like, what is this thing? It's kind of like kitschy, but it is amazing. I mean, the thing you can really put out a dinner so quickly and I'm not plugging it. I'm just like saying, you know, a pressure cooker is, is a very fantastic tool, um, especially if you have a family and you just need to get food on the table really quickly. So I've been doing a lot of like braises and uh, stews and stuff like that in there. What was the last thing you made in the Instant Pot? Ooh, it was, I took a, a beef chuck roast and mm -hmm. then I like seared it off. I put a lot of, just whatever aromatics I had and you guys can follow along with this. It's just like onions, garlic, ginger. I happen to have lemongrass, so I threw mm -hmm. that in there. I put a can of tomatoes and some red wine and then I, did, did she I just disappear? So it's for a little second. Yeah, oh, I, was like, I saw it. The red wine, yeah. <laughs> I'm back, right? Okay, um, it was kind of like a French, uh, red wine, like beef stew, but had like these Asian, you know, elements to it. And it was awesome. I put it, I served it on top of some steamed rice with a little bit of lime juice and cilantro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Natalie wants to know what's been keeping you up at night? What's been keeping me up? Um, all of these text messages and like random. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I think thinking about the future and just, I mean, everything, like the Black Lives Matter. I remember I was like, that was keeping me up a lot um, and and still is, but continuing to think of, you know, how can I, can, how can I keep creating and what, what do I want to create? And, and because there's so many opportunities flooding in right now. And then also how can I use that and apply it to something better um, for the rest of the world? So those kind of thoughts always run through my head really late at night <laughs> and I can't sleep. Yes. Um, Cindy Kong wants to know, are there any plans realizing your restaurant idea during restaurant wars? Yeah, so the, soul, the whole Sabrina concept, that's actually a real concept that I had worked on um, and it's based around my grandmother for people that didn't watch. Um, but I would love to open some sort of modern Californian restaurant with Asian flavors and kind of, you know, and more of an up elevated um, concept where I could have the opportunity to achieve a Michelin star or James Beard or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at the moment, it's a little bit on a pause with COVID and um, also living in one of the most expensive cities in the world. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's all about the right timing and the right place um, to make that goal happen, but it's certainly still there. Well, we're excited to finally <laughs> you all sit down and enjoy your food in person together. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Ariel wants to know what should we be keeping in our pantry or freezer to keep things interesting now that we're all mostly eating from home three times of the day? This is definitely a question from Googlers. <laughs> all right, Ariel. Um, I would say that for my my own pantry, I always have always have canned San, Mar San Marzano tomatoes. I think they're just super versatile. Um, I always have fish sauce. Uh, bonito flakes are really fun. These are all just like the umami bomb sort of ingredients that I feel everyone should have in their pantry to really boost up flavor. Um, ginger, onions, you know, the typical aromatics I always have as well on hand. And then keep some fresh herbs. I think, you know, that is always a game changing ingredient that really can just elevate a dish. Um, and then miso is also a really fun ingredient to play with that you can you can marinate things with that and also um, add it to your stews and braises. Um, I think that yeah, my rattling off a lot. I can ramble on and on about this topic. <laughs> There's different miso, right? What do you recommend? There's different what? Miso's. 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 I would start with um, like a yellow or white miso. That's going to be a little sweeter. It'll have less salt content than like a red miso. Um, and it's great, like again, it's great to use as a marinade for um, chicken or pork chops. Uh, and then if you do if you do the red miso and you wanna kind of level up a little more, it's gonna have a lot more flavor. 
um, but use less because it's it's pretty salty. Um, and then use that for like red meats, you know, like a beef or um, pork, I think would be a good option. Yeah, sounds good. I have a few that I need to add. <laughs> yeah. um, your hobbies? How do you like to unwind after a long day filming or a long day on the job in the kitchen? In normal life or quarantine life? <laughs> in, in normal life, I like to, I like to, again, go out hiking. I like to get outdoors. I walk all over the city. I love urban hiking and just kind of exploring uh, different neighborhoods. I feel I'm at like every coffee shop in the city, usually grabbing toast or a cappuccino somewhere. Um, the farmer's market is also like one of my little unwind kind of places to go. I love the one in San Rafael. I think it's such a cute farmer's market, great, pro beautiful produce, but Be better than the ferry building. <laughs> <laughs> Less That's crowded, you know, because I know you guys are at one market. <laughs> Some of you are at one market and it, it gets a little overwhelming there, but go to the one in San Rafael. It's a really cute farmer's market. You will need to take the ferry over to get to San Rafael. I think you can. I think you can. Jessica Foley, she's interested in hearing your perspective on plant-based lifestyle and meals. How important is it to you when you cook or create new dishes? And thanks so much for your input. Hi, Jessica. Um, I, I always think about how can I make my recipes adaptable to all diets? Um, because I know, I know, especially being a San Franciscan, I know so many friends that are vegan, gluten-free, or have certain um, yeah, just dietary restrictions. Even, even myself, when I eat at home, I tend to eat a lot of leafy greens, a lot of vegetables, and maybe like a little bit of salmon or protein on the side. Um, but I'm, I'm constantly thinking about how to please everyone, but I think that's just part of my job <laughs> as a chef. Um, and so a lot of, even my virtual cooking classes um, on my website, those are all adaptable. You know, I, I may have something that's, like here's a kimchi beef uh, dumpling dish, but it's, I always leave a plant-based uh, recipe available so that you can also follow along with me, but you can do your own, your own version of it. Um, but I think it's, I think it's great. I think vegetables are such a, and I, I've always felt this way from day, from the day one of my first Top Chef, vegetables are so underrated. And I, I think my mission throughout the season and of both my seasons was to really highlight that especially being a Californian chef and just seeing how beautiful the produce is here. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's great that people are starting to lean into that, uh, that type of diet because it's, it makes you feel good. You know, vegetables are, it's the base of my, my diet. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And it's good for the environment too. And that too, exactly. Like it's a win-win all around. So like, why not support and, and eat more plants? Yeah. So a couple of people watching would love to know of the chefs eliminated in the earlier half of the Top Chef season, who are you uh -huh. most surprised to see go? Um, I was surprised to see Nini leave um, and also Greg. I think those were like the two big shockers for me. Um, Nini's an amazing chef. She is brilliant. She, she does a lot of R&D. That's kind of her background in, in pastries, but she's a very um, brilliant chef. And then Greg, I mean, you guys all know, he's like, I've, we've, we've gone through competition together. We've been friends for years, um, but I was very surprised to see him, to see him not in the top three. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard. Yeah. Um, Pe Pedro wants to say, congrats Mel, and what is the secret ingredient of your Szechuan sauce? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see if I told you. <laughs> let's see here. Um, you know, a, a secret ingredient is actually the um, fermented black beans. So they're these Chinese um, salt preserved black beans that kind of that has a lot of umami. Um, so that's one of many secret ingredients that I'm that I will reveal on this call. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of your sauces, how do people find your sauce? Where? Do, how do people support you? I know we have some merch that you're selling. Yes, <laughs> I love it. You got the queen one. Is that the pride one? It is. The, the embroidery on, on the other yeah. side. 
I think it's the other side. Yeah, but uh, so there's a little rainbow. Yeah, so I, I created a merch line and that was honestly just for fun. At first I, I had just created it for friends and family. And then next thing you know, quarantine happened and I'm like, maybe I should start selling this. And it turned into a king line that turned into a queen okay. line, <laughs> masks. <laughs> and so five, like $5 of every pride hat will go towards the Trevor Project. Um, I felt it was just important right now, especially with Pride Month and everything, to support where I can. And so the, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Trevor Project, um, it's a national organization that uh, really is trying to give suicide prevention support for LGBTQ youths. Um, so I just, I love their mission. Um, I'm, I've been supporting them for years. And so please check out the merch on chefmelissaking.com. Um, I have a shop there and you can find, you know, the virtual cooking classes that are available to rewatch and some of the live streams that will be coming up in the future. Um, and then also the merch line and the sauces. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna see if there's any other questions from the audience. So Heather Lou wants to know, what's your favorite thing to cook when you're lazy, but still want something delicious? <laughs> favorite thing to cook when I'm lazy. Um, it's usually just a pan seared salmon with like salad. Cause I can, I can prepare that in like five minutes because fish, I think, um, yeah, don't cook it longer than five minutes. People out there <laughs> just get a nice sear hot pan, put it in set it on one side and let it cook for like four minutes and then flip it on the other side for literally 30 seconds, take it out of the pan and it should be perfect. And then I just throw together a salad with whatever I have, but not the way that I did on that, that Polly mountain challenge. <laughs> that was my least favorite challenge of the entire season. <laughs> Do you want to share salad. a little bit more about that? Do you want to redeem yourself and talk through that? I, moment I mean, it <laughs> It's just, it's a hard, that was a hard challenge because I felt it did, it set all of us up for failure and none of us walked away very proud of what we had created um, because it was, there was so, such a high volume of food that we had to produce in a very short amount of time with extremely limited resources. Mm -hmm. And I think I was, I was playing way too nice. I kind of just let everyone poach everything and I got left with scraps. <laughs> so I learned my lesson on that one and I like carried it into the next challenge and was like, you know what, I'm taking the Kaiseki thing. Like I'm gonna take the steam category in the Kaiseki and you guys take whatever you want, <laughs> but I'm taking this category. Farah wants to know if you can host a dinner party for three people, dead or alive, who would it be and what dishes would you serve? This is such a hard question. <laughs> I, I mean, the first person in my head that popped in there was uh, was Anthony Bourdain, mm -hmm. I think would be a good one. Um, Obama. And then uh, I love cooking for Oprah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I've cooked for her before, but um, I she's just such an amazing, she's so easy. She eats anything. Uh, a lot of truffles. She loves truffles. Mm. But what would I cook? I would cook something really simple. Like I don't, I think with food, I, I like to keep it simple. You know, it would maybe be like a whole fish that's grilled over a fire. Um, you know, some perfect tomatoes from the summertime with a little bit of sea salt and burrata. Just keep it really simple and delicious and high quality as far as the ingredients. So that's the some rice too. There's got to be some okay. rice in there rice. somewhere. <laughs> So I can't live without rice. I know I know you guys feel me on that one. <laughs> yes. No, rice with everything or cauliflower rice. Exactly. <laughs> All right. We're waiting to see if there's any other questions live <clears throat> from the audience. There's always these malarkey questions. I see it on here. <laughs> I love malarkey, you guys. He's um, I think on TV you see the intense sides to him, which is true. Like that's very much him. Um, he loves he can sell anything he's a chatter but he is literally he has a heart of gold he is the sweetest human um he was always the one chef that was extremely positive to anyone that was on the bottom of the challenge he would always say something really nice to you um so he i i love him he's endearing not annoying drew i think some drew asked that question <laughs> 
calling you out here. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a difficult time in the food industry right now with the pandemic threatening a lot of businesses and livelihoods. What's top of mind for you um, as shelters in place orders start to lift? How can Googlers and individuals support the food industry and restaurants that have been impacted or shut down? Yeah, I think the main thing is continue to patron their restaurants, continue to support where you can, go buy takeout, go get delivery, but don't do it through an app, you know, because the app is going to take a large percentage of that. And so try to go, you know, in person, show show up for these restaurants, because I think that's what they, that's what we need right now. We need we need your help. So. Yeah. And then also check out, uh, go online. I know there's some organizations that, uh, you know, you can go um, to, to saverestaurants.com or even the James Beard Foundation. There's a, a few resources there to learn more about how you can donate and where, where it'll go um, and how you can support. Thank you for those tips. Yeah. Um, from Lauren O'Neill. She says, I love the Kaiseki dinner and how you elevated the others by signing courses based on their strengths and preferences. How have you grown with regards to leadership and teamwork over the years? Great question. Great question. Um, I think it's just, I've, I've, I learned that actually throughout my career with all the, the chefs that I had worked under. I was just fortunate to work under very strong leaders uh, from Dominique Crenn to Ron Siegel that really valued um, respect and respecting the people that you're with. Um, and I think this goes across all industries. You know, you, you need to respect your employees and your, your coworkers and the people that are helping you to achieve, to achieve the bigger goal. And so um, with, that, with that moment, I felt, you know, why, like they, I remember they kept asking, how come you don't want to sabotage people? Like, why are you being so nice? And I was like, well, why would I, why would I do that? You know, <laughs> like that just doesn't make sense to me. Cause mm -hmm. that's just not how I was raised and how I was bred um, through the kitchens. And so I wanted to just play fairly. And I felt, you know, if, if, if I'm going to win this challenge, I want to make sure I win fairly and, and that everyone ha can play at their strengths. So I think it was just supporting uh, supporting them and giving them the categories that they wanted has made sense to me. Awesome. Mm -hmm. There are a few more questions that are going to come on screen. So from David, in the finale, you mentioned that fusion is now a bit of a dirty word in the culinary world. What do you feel is the best way to approach fusion without potentially appropriating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's a dirty word, but it's, it's a very... Um, yeah, it could be controversial because <laughs> I think fusion kind of came up in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and I think at that time, it was still so new, the idea of, you know, what is real Chinese food or what is real Asian food? And I I, I just actually watched Padma's um, Taste the Nation and she had sent me an, an episode on Chinese cooking in America mm -hmm. and how there's um, chop suey. And we're like, what the heck is chop suey? Like, I don't even know what that is. And I'm Chinese. And it really, what it is, it's a, it was an invention of, um, of basically trying to acclimate Asian cuisine to American culture. And, mm -hmm. but it's not a traditional or a true um, dish. And so to me, that was like a fusion, mm -hmm. a bad fusion that kind of went the wrong way uh, to just please the American palate. And so, mm -hmm. I hope and my, my, my whole journey through Top Chef and my mission and my goal was to highlight Asian food and show that it's not just greasy, uh, cheap and fast food that you can get at a chop suey house. It, it has so much more integrity behind it and authenticity behind it. So I uh, really tried my best to highlight that, but like not appropriate but you know, use my knowledge as a chef and as a person that has traveled to many places and many cultures um, to learn these, these flavors um, and, and hybrid it in a way that felt tasteful and not uh, appropriation. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's been incredible just to watch you kind of cook from your heritage, right? And to really elevate that from the California cuisine perspective. like different, yeah. even when you shared the ar aromatics to keep in our pantry, like it's it's very Asian inspired. Or Asian yeah, inspired. yeah. And I think that that was also another goal of mine and, and I hope to maybe make a cookbook around it um, is to, you know, 
introduce these Asian ingredients and make it feel very um, accessible and, and easy for you to use. Like you shouldn't feel intimidated by fish sauce and, and bonito and, and these sort of ingredients out there. They should be a part of your pantry staple, especially as a Californian. I think it's like, we're very much used to using ingredients from different cultures and blending it together into one. Absolutely. And then that even goes to kind of where you source the ingredients, right? From the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. So using Asian produce by Asian grown farmers and, and other yeah. really is the whole ecosystem. Exactly. Yeah. All right. We have a question from Kitty. As an Asian American chef, were there uh, any Asian chefs that inspired you growing up or even today? I don't see too many. So I'm really glad to see you thrive and to see someone who looks like me. Thank you. Um, I I had a huge childhood obsession with Martin Yan, <laughs> and I know it's like it's Martin Yan, like, but he at the time there was no one on television and uh, that looked like me, and no one that was you know in the position that he was, and so I remember watching PBS, uh, just cook, like PBS cook, the cook it was the old cooking channel before the Food Network. And Martin Yan was always on there. Ming Tsai was on there. And those were two people that I just admired throughout my ele elementary years um, because they just, you know, felt like me. And so now I I've been fortunate enough to meet them in real life and, and I know them. And so that's, it it's just come full circle and it's incredible to see. Yeah, and now you're inspiring the next generation as well, right? You're inspiring. <laughs> I hope so. Yes, yes thank I feel you. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, from Dennis. Congrats, Melissa. With the conversation around racism in the food or me food me media industry, what kinds of changes would you like to see to help unbias those systems and structures? Yeah, you know, I think right now is a very it's a, it's a hard enough of a time on restaurants with the pandemic, but the ones that are suffering also and maybe mo most are the Asian restaurants. Um, I think there is a lot of. Um, anti-Asian sentiment and racism happening because of the pandemic. And I, I know personal friends of mine that have restaurants that people aren't, people aren't going there because they're scared. And you know what, I hope that people um, see through that and that they go and, you know, order your favorite takeout from, or, or order your favorite dim sum down the street, you know, from your favorite Chinese restaurant. Like don't like live, don't let that fear uh, take over. And so I hope moving forward, um, the Asian restaurants can get a lot more support from from Americans and, and the world right now because they, they need it most. Right. And they've been around for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Drinking my Hong Kong milk tea here, guys. <laughs> from Tara, I miss my home food a lot now that I can't get home to it in Singapore. I have particular dishes that make me feel at home. What are some of the dishes that make you feel at home? Mm. Um, it's always kanji. I feel like that's like the number one thing that reminds me of my mom. It reminds me of my grandmother. Um, I, and yeah, I have, I have a little, I did it on the show and I have a cooking class around it, but kanji felt so comforting. It was, it's like the Asian chicken noodle soup, you know, when you're sick at home and, and you need, you just need a little love. <laughs> and then here comes mom with the bowl of warm kanji. So I, I yeah, that was, for sure my number one uh, favorite like food memory and, and something that just reminds me of home. That's and like so Chinese cool. Chinese bone broths is another one, like the Cantonese style ones. That was one of the first things I had learned how to make as a kid. Um, it was like a whole chicken in a pot of water with some goji berries and like ginseng. Mm -hmm. And we would just let that boil for four to six hours. And so there's all these different variations of uh, Cantonese style bone broths that that always remind me of of my mom. That sounds delicious. Can you make that in an instant pot? You can. You yeah. absolutely can. Yeah. There's all different kinds, but you can try like pork bones with ginger, mm -hmm. apple, and carrot, and throw that in the instant pot. Let it roll for like an hour. I think you'll get a good soup there. Sounds perfect. Um, people want to know more about the Hong Kong milk tea you're drinking. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. This one, this one was actually just a Hong Kong powder that um, uh, my family gets, and I just I added a little condensed milk to it. But it's made of Ceylon tea, 
and I, I had used um, this on on the tiramisu uh, challenge, the finale. Yeah, the Hong Kong milk tiramisu. Yeah. So in the spirit of pride, um, brunch is a big part of um, the gay culture. What are some of your favorite brunch spots in LA where you're sheltering in place in your in San Francisco and then maybe even in New York? Yeah, yeah. Um, Squirrel in LA, fantastic place for brunch. Um, San Francisco, where do I go for brunch? <laughs> I feel like I've been everywhere for brunch, like foreign cinema and um, Nopa. I've been everywhere for brunch over there. But I can't think. I go to Tartine Manufactory a lot just to kind of like grab a ham and cheese croissant, which are the best and my absolute favorite thing. Um, and then New York, what's the name of that place? La, I think it's called La Mercier. Beautiful. They have like, they sell ceramics. There's a whole art collection in the back room, but the restaurant space is, has like a florist attached to it. Really beautiful space. From Rebecca, have you tried making any TikTok recipes <laughs> during quarantine? <laughs> I refuse to sign up for TikTok. I <laughs> I, this is where I get old or where you're, where I'm aging myself. I just, I don't understand it. And I have too many other like social life. It's a social overload at the moment. And I've refused to turn to even try to sign up for TikTok, <laughs> even though I probably should. I'm sure it's fun, but I have not touched it. But you can get to it after your 400 text messages from. Yeah, I mean, I did do one. I did one little TikTok thing for the James Beard Foundation. I think they'll la launch that soon. But they said they would also put it on Instagram. So I'm waiting for that. But that was the closest I got to a TikTok uh, creation. All right. Was there any dancing involved? Uh, no, no dancing. <laughs> Is that what happens on TikTok? <laughs> there's dancing, there's exercise. There's we were like throwing pantry ingredients to each other. So like there's Nini, um, Jen Carroll, Leanne, a couple people from the show. And we were just like throwing ingredients to each other. So, and I'm like catching it and, and creating something with it. So it was pretty creative. If someone were to buy a sauce, which is the first one they would buy, um, I would suggest the Sichuan chili sauce. Chili sauce is kind of my favorite thing and I put it I literally put it on everything um like my pizza my pasta noodles uh and you can cook with it too so it's a condiment and versatile in the kitchen uh the fish sauce caramel is also very unique and different but um that is more for grilled items so if you're mm -hmm. grilling ribs or you're grilling chicken wings then you would want to just finish it with the fish sauce caramel and just glaze glaze whatever it is that you're making and it can be cabbage or vegetables, like what I did on the show. It's delish. Um, are any, is there a different spice level for each of the sauces? Um, I would say the mala chili oil is the one that, that's got more heat to it. The Sichuan chili sauce itself is not very hot. Um, it tingles a little, but I kept it pretty friendly. <laughs> but the mala chili oil, I, I kicked it up a bit more um, and it'll make your mouth numb. Uh -oh. In a good way. In a good way. <laughs> pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. <laughs> I'm a pancake person. Love a good pancake. Did I get to connect with Dario after the episode? No, I didn't. And I honestly, I didn't know he cried until a little later. Because when you're in that situation, you serve the food and then you walk away and then they do their thing. And so I had no idea what was actually happening um, in that world. But when they told me, I remember crying and just getting very emotional about it. And then when I watched it again last Thursday um, and, and seeing it in real life, how much my food just impacted him um, brought me to tears. So it was a lot, there was a lot of crying on Thursday. <laughs> very emotional day. Yeah. Jenny all wants to know, what's your next Humphrey Slow Cream ice cream flavor? We loved all of them, she said. Ah, well, I, we haven't actually had a moment to sit down and talk about that. So right now we, we just, we're going with the Hong Kong milk tea ice cream. And we also have the almond chocolate crunch, which is plant-based. Um, and they're both available at um, Whole Foods markets and uh, the Humphrey Slow Cream scoop shops. And, and not all markets though, you kind of have to, you have to go hunt it down but it's there somewhere. 
from Rachel Choi. She wants to know what's your go-to guilty pleasure food? I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, cookies are like a nut, like a really, I have a sweet tooth. I can eat cookies all day long, any form, any shape. I don't care what it is as long as it's a cookie. <laughs> And I think on on the show, the whole all the other chefs in the cast house would kind of make fun of me because I would it'd be like five in the morning and we have to wake up and we're eating breakfast and I would just like bust out a bag of cookies <laughs> and they're like, are you seriously gonna eat cookies right before we go do a qu quick fire? And I'm like, what? I'm stressed. I need to. I need something to calm me down. Like, <laughs> so yeah, chocolate chip cookies are kind of my thing. Yeah, and I love a good burger. I love just like a simple, good grilled burger. Yeah. Where do you go for your essential cookies in San Francisco and LA? Is there a bakery that you like? I I, I like hot cookie cookies Ooh. in the Castro. Yeah. I mean, the toffee chocolate chip thing is just like amazing. It's like a perfect cookie. Um, LA. I don't know where to go in LA. Actually, is anybody else? Maybe you guys can tell me where to go in LA. Plus, I'm stuck here. I can't really go anywhere. <laughs> turn your face. Favorite fast food, in and out hands down. California girl here. Can't say no to in and out I don't eat any other fast food, but in and out What's your order? Uh, I get the cheeseburger animal style with animal style fries. Maybe a Neapolitan shake. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It depends on my mood. <laughs> I'm sure about it. It's a lot. Yeah, it depends if I'm pelotoning. <laughs> How are meals done at the Top Chef house? <laughs> we, it's just whoever wants to cook, cook. So oftentimes we eat out a lot because there's just, there's no time um, between filming to, to slow down. So they, they buy us food. Um, I remember I was living off of sugar fish like every other day. <laughs> so I was just being a brat <laughs> and I just, I wanted Asian food. Um, but we would cook a lot actually. So uh, on other moments, but we had some downtime. And I think that's our stress relief as it's crazy because cooking stresses us out in the competition, but outside of the competition, we can separate that. And so it was oftentimes Brian and Kevin grilling, uh, grilling meats. And then I would make a 20 um, avocado bowl of guacamole like every every other day or so it became it became such a big hit. And then Nini would make pies and like crazy desserts. And so there was always food and, and we were we would just center around the kitchen and, and hang out there. We, we needed to do something to keep ourselves busy and, and de-stress. Yeah. And everything. The sugar fish sushi and cookies and guacamole <laughs> sounds like you had it all covered. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need in life is a little sushi and cookies. <laughs> okay, we have two more questions. Um how long is judges table? It's a long it was a long time, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I mean, if you think about it, like you watch the show, you see 45 minutes with commercials, um, you know, that makes an hour of the show, but this is in real life time, it's like days and hours of, of footage that needs to be condensed down. So I, when I watch, I sometimes get a little frustrated because I'm like, there's so much that happens. And like the viewer sees just literally like the fast forwarded shortcut version of what's happening and it's all the good parts but it's it, it would be nice to see the in between of how the thought process is and how people get to where they are with the dishes that they create um but it takes a long time judges table they they really want to make sure they dissect every detail of what you did and what you, what you could have done better and yeah and grade accordingly from Ayana. She wants to know, before the finale, the judges cooked for the finalists. What was that like, eating their food, knowing you'd be judged the next day? It was incredible. And it was one of my favorite moments because we, we didn't expect it. We thought we were just walking into some restaurant. And um, I just, I felt like that was the one moment we got to really connect with them. Like it felt like we were off camera, but we obviously were on camera, but it felt really um, great to just be taken care of by them and not be judged. And then we were judging them <laughs> and kind of messing around and giving them a hard time. But the um, my most the memorable dish of the night was certainly, I thought Padma's um, 
she did made like a kale bean soup, an Italian kale bean soup, and she put Indian spices in there. Mm -hmm. So she kind of did the hybrid thing and brought some of her culture in and she put coriander seeds and cumin seeds. And after that, I was like, I'm always going to make this dish this way. It's so good. Um, and then Gail made a beautiful tart with a lot of the local ingredients with like local chestnut honey and cheese. And so it was, it was just a very fantastic meal. Sounds incredible. Um, we have two questions. So the, the, we are, what's your favorite dim sum? In LA, or I guess since I'm in LA, um, I would say a favorite, oh, favorite type, oh, favorite dim sum dish. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. I, I love a good, um, what, uh, let's see, hey, I, I always eat, well, my guy, like the, it's like a, kind of like an Asian tamale with like sticky rice and it's wrapped with a lotus leaf. Inside has the sticky rice with chicken, shiitake mushrooms, sometimes abalone, but that one is very comforting to me. Uh, what other ones? I feel like I always order siumai. That's just like, I, I'm a siumai person versus hagao. Mm. If given the choice, <laughs> but why choose? But why choose? There's so many good things. All right, and our last question for today is: What are your favorite cookbooks and non-cookbooks that you're reading right now in quarantine? Um, let's see here. Oh, there's been so much. I don't even have time to read anything right now. But uh, cookbooks. Um, I always, I'm just always buying like all whatever the latest thing is. So. I know like Chef Evan Funky came out. He was on the show. He um, did the pasta. Uh, he's the guy who hand rolls pastas. He has a restaurant here in LA in Venice called Felix. But his cookbook is incredible, very inspiring for anyone that wants to learn how to make um, make pasta by hand. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, a lot of the restaurants in San Francisco I also buy, like um, the State Bird Provisions book, the Rich, Rich Table books kind of the more chef-y, chef-driven ones, I always really enjoy because I can really dissect and learn more about their inspiration and how they started their businesses. So I go from there. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of picked up Crazy Rich Asians to you just did. like read it. Yeah, it was like, I saw my mom had it on her table and I was like, I'm just gonna like steal this. <laughs> Even though I've seen the movie like a million times, but uh, yeah, I figured I would just read through it and check it out. Absolutely, another great celebration. Got to support, you know? Yeah, exactly. All right, well, we are at time. Thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us here at Talks at Google. Um, everyone, please check out chefmelissaking.com. Where else can we find? Where else can we support? <laughs> I'd like Instagram. Yeah, chefmelissaking.com is kind of where you'll find all the resources. And then um, catch me on Instagram, also Chef Melissa King. Twitter. I'm always posting out like the latest thing that I'm working on over my social. So you can't, you won't miss it. Yeah. Subscribe to post notifications so you can get your hands on that. Yes, slot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for having me today. Um, happy pride too. Happy pride. Happy pride. <laughs>